All right. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Kaleser, Dr. Valano, for inviting me. So I have no financial disclosures. Um, the objectives of today's talk are, um, so we're going to try and figure out when and if to order next generation sequencing, the clinical significance of next generation sequencing, translating genomics into uh, practice, some recent advances in GI malignancy, how the results can be used for therapeutic uh, purposes, and which findings should be conveyed to the patients. Um, at the end of the talk, um, I hope we're able to discern the role of next generation sequencing in the care of GI malignancies, its indications, prognostic, and therapeutic effects, um, how they help screen for familial conditions, genetic predispos uh, predispositions to cancer, and better our understanding of cancer biology, uh, diagnostics, and therapeutics. So cancer is a disease of the genome. GI malignancies are uh, particularly clinically and molecularly heterogeneous. There's a lot of intrapatient, intrapatient and intratumoral uh, variability. The concept of precision medicine uh, goes hand in hand with an understanding of the cancer genome as de uh, determined by next generation sequencing. Um, in oncology, precision medicine uh, strives to find the right drug for the right patient at the right time. So there are some basket trials that are available, uh, NCI MATCH trial and IMPACT trial. And um, the NCI MATCH trial uh, is incorporated with Foundation One, which is one of the tumor uh, profiling platforms that, uh, that has been used. Um, I just want to spend a couple minutes on uh, liquid biopsies. And uh, in a study that was presented at um, 2017 um, ESMO World Congress on gastrointestinal tumors, uh, plasma was collected at disease progression from about 39 patients. And what we found was that we were able to um, identify mechanism of resistance in about 80% of these patients. So there has also been some intriguing uh, uh, data, it's emerging data, about tracking response to therapy. This is particularly in KRAS mutated patients. And uh, in such patient population, you can have a very high level of uh, KRAS mutated DNA in the blood. And that level can plummet significantly when effective treatment is given. So this can potentially be used to track responses uh, to treatment. Looking at the differences between uh, tumor tissue and liquid biopsies, um, we all know that we sometimes struggle obtaining um, adequate samples to send out molecular testing. And um, uh, there's also a, a thought of heterogeneity of tumors where if you take a, a, a biopsy from a single site, that might not tell you the entire story. On the other hand, uh, liquid biopsies are, are reasonably sensitive and uh, they're easily collectible. And I do think that there will be uh, focused applications in the, in the future where liquid biopsies will have profound effects um, in, in tracking resistance, in looking at responses, looking at minimal residual diseases, um, and early uh, detection of recurrences. So moving on to colorectal cancer. So we're all well aware of the EGFR signaling pathway in, in colorectal cancer. Anti-EGFR therapy was a, one of the first targeted agents that we've used in advanced colon cancers. And um, we know the, the RAS story uh, in colon cancer. We'll talk a little bit about the, the BRAF mutations. Um, so the BRAF B600 E mutation is associated with uh, dismal prognosis and resistance to anti-EGFR therapy. If you look at the overall survival data, patients that are uh, BRAF mutated uh, tend to do uh, worse. Their median survival is about 13 months as compared to patients who are wild type. Um, and their median survival is about uh, 34 months. So 13 months compared to 34 months. And if you look at the, um, the downstream signaling of, of RAF, so it, it has tremendous uh, downstream signaling, but it also feeds back to the EGFR receptor. So BRAF mutated tumors actually have um, a very high EGFR expression. So we have to stop the EGFR expression in order for the BRAF inhibitors to work. So there's some data on the use of uh, anti-BRAF agents alone, and the response rates in those patient populations pretty dismal, about 5 to 
if these agents are combined with an anti-EGFR drug, the response rates improve to about 20%. And if they are combined with, uh, uh, with another agent, be it irinotecan or chemotherapy or MEK inhibitors, the response rates uh, improve to about 35% or so. So these are the various strategies that have been uh, tried in BRAF mutated patients. Uh, using a combination of BRAF inhibitors, anti-EGFR therapy, combining it with either MEK inhibitors or, or chemotherapy or uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. Uh, this is uh, an ongoing trial, the Beacon trial, that's looking at exactly the same thing. Uh, again, combination of BRAF inhibitors, MEK inhibitors, uh, cetuximab compared to BRAF in inhibitors, cetuximab compared to chemotherapy. So HER2 um, overexpression, so this is seen in about 4 to 5% uh, of colorectal cancers. And um, HER2 overexpression is found more commonly on the left side as compared to the right side. And these patients, if they have a RAS wild type, they typically have resistance to anti-EGFR um, therapy. And this was based on retrospective data. So this was a trial that was done in Europe. Um, it was done on 27 patients who had uh, HER2 positive colorectal cancers and uh, trastuzumab and lipatinib was used after um, multiple lines of chemotherapy and uh, response rates of about 30% uh, were noted. So this is pretty encouraging, especially in patients who've, had, uh, who've, who've been heavily pretreated before. There is uh, an ongoing SWOG trial uh, using trastuzumab and pertuzumab versus cetuximab and arinotecan in HER2-positive colorectal cancer patients. Moving on to the um, MSI status and immune therapy in not only in colorectal cancer, but um, other GI malignancies. So uh, microsatellites are short repetitive DNA sequences that are prone to error during replication. They're normally repaired by mismatch repair genes and uh, mutations in these genes can lead to altered length uh, microsatellites. This then causes uh, microsatellite instability and tumorigenesis. Now remember that th these mutations can either be sporadic, and in a very small per percentage, these mutations are, are germline mutations and then associated with, with Lynch syndrome. Um, it's also important to know that BRAF mutations um, are usually associated with sporadic uh, MMR um, mutations because BRAF mutations uh, is a result of hypermethylation that can then cause deficiency in the repair uh, mismatch genes. So we have three uh, methods of testing MSI status. One of them is a PCR, um, uh, immunohistochemistry. We can probably miss about 10% of patients using these methods because of interlab variability. Um, I think next generation sequencing is a great way of looking um, at MSI status and it's becoming uh, more popular. Um, so if you look at the tumor mutation uh, burden in MSI high tumors, they are high up on the plot, meaning that these are tumors that, are, that have high mutation burden, they are immunogenic, they have high new antigen uh, load. So all in all, Tumors, again, not only colorectal cancer, but all um, GI, other GI malignancies that, are, that have high MSI, uh, high status, respond to uh, PD-1 inhibitors. So based on that, uh, FDA granted accelerated approval to pembrolizumab for its first site tissue uh, agnostic uh, indication. So it's, it's approved for use in any solid tumor that is MSI high after first or second line of uh, therapy. So I think the, the main interest is in uh, MSI stable patients where we're trying to use immune therapy, we're trying to use strategies to make these tumors more immunogenic, uh, be it by combination of immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, or addition of uh, MEK inhibitors, specifically this uh, uh, study that was uh, done using cobimetinib, which, used some, um, which showed some encouraging uh, responses. So the way we look at colorectal cancer is uh, we look at it molecularly. Uh, we want to know if it's MSI high, MSI stable. Uh, what's the RAS status of the tumor? Is it BRAF mutated? What's the uh, HER2 status of the tumor? Uh, anatomy has played an important role um, recently as well. We know that left-sided tumors behave differently than right-sided tumors. And more, more recently, there's been a lot of interest in microbiome, uh, stool for a type, et cetera. 
So moving on to the uh, GE junction and gastric cancers. So we all know about the TOGA trial that got uh, um, trastuzumab approved for HER2-positive um, advanced gastric adenocarcinomas. This was about 10 years ago. So what, what's new uh, in gastric cancer? So these um, couple of um, uh, agents were, were presented at the recent uh, GI ASCO meeting. One of them is uh, GS5745, which is a humanized monoclonal antibody against matrix medalloproteinase 9, which causes inhibition of extracellular matrix protein degradation and potentially inhibition of angiogenesis, um, tumor growth invasion, and uh, spread. So this was studied in a phase one uh, study with uh, Folfox. There was a, a response rate of about 55% and a PFS of about 12 months in chemo naive patients. So the second agent that's been looked at is uh, Clodiximab. Uh, Clodins are a major structural component of tight junctions and IMAP362 is a chimeric antibody highly specific for Clodin 18.2. Um, modes of action include antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, complement-dependent cytotoxicity, and immunomodulation of uh, tumor microenvironment. So this was uh, studied in phase two FAST trial, and uh, it was basically a chemotherapy arm versus the chemotherapy plus the IMAP arm, and there was definitely a survival benefit in the uh, experimental arm. Another target that we're looking at in uh, gastric cancers is FGFR2, which is uh, present in about 2 to 5% of gastric cancers. Um, and this agent, FK144, is a humanized monoclonal antibody which binds to the FGFR2B. And uh, initial studies have shown some good responses uh, to this agent. So there is definitely an emerging role for immune therapy in gastric cancers. Pembrolizumab is currently approved for patients who've progressed on a platinum and fluoropyrimidine-based regimen in the third-line setting. And there are ongoing trials looking at immune therapy in the um, adjuvant setting as well. Moving on to pancreatic cancers. So uh, there is a relatively low mutation burden that we see in, in pancreatic cancers. There is very small incidence of MSI high, and most of the driver genes are, are non-targetable. But occasionally there are uh, low frequency uh, events in terms of uh, BRCA, in terms of um, NTRAC, uh, uh, BRAF, um, et cetera, that can potentially be targetable either off-label or um, in clinical trials. So, I think the important question about uh, pancreatic cancer is, uh, should we be doing germline testing um, in all patients? So this was um, a large pan cancer analysis that was done at Memorial Sloan Catering. And uh, they identified, so as there was a 16% identification rate of, of germline mutations. So this clearly has a role, not only in therapeutics, but also in identifying uh, affected family members. So this uh, slide touches upon the um, um, therapeutic um, advantages of checking uh, germline BRCA uh, mutations. So uh, use of platinum agents along with uh, PARP inhibitors in patients who had positive mutations versus negative mutations. So patients with positive mutations definitely uh, benefited from these agents. And uh, this is an ongoing uh, trial in advanced stage pancreatic cancer that's looking at use of PARP inhibitors upfront with chemotherapy. So what we've learned is that germline uh, testing is definitely uh, beneficial in identifying uh, BRCA mutations, MSI uh, high uh, patients, because this is associated with Lynch syndrome. Somatic testing is somewhat controversial in pancreatic cancer just because there are very few uh, targetable genes uh, or mutations at this point. So a little bit about STAT3. Um, the reason that response rates to systemic therapy uh, decrease with time occurs not only because of changes in the uh, molecular characteristics of the tumor, but, because, but also because of enrichment of uh, cancer stem cells, which are by definition chemoresistant. So STAT3 is a key regulator, of, uh, is a key regulator and uh, plays an important role 
in the survival and proliferation of cancer stem cells. Napabucicin is an oral inhibitor of STAT3 that blocks these cancer stem cells uh, self-renewal and potentially kills these cells. So uh, this agent is used in combination with, with chemotherapy, not only in gastric cancers, but it's been look, looked at in colorectal as well as pancreatic cancers. Moving on to hepatocellular cancer. So um, this is, these are the current therapies that we use in hepatocellular cancers. Uh, we have sorafenib and lenvatinib in the first line. Uh, second line, we have regorafenib, cabozantinib, and uh, nivolumab. Um, I think if you look at hepatocellular carcinoma, it's sort of the same like it was in pancreatic cancer. The number of uh, driver mutations are not too many, and um, most of these mutations are passenger mutations, and the driver mutations, unfortunately, are undruggable um, at this time. So um, there are two high-level amplifications that contain driver oncogenes uh, in hepatocellular cancer. One of them is the... Uh, VEGF A, and the second one is uh, 11Q13, which, which contains FGF19 and uh, cyclin D1. Um, and FGF19 is, is a molecular driving, driver in hepatocellular cancer. This can either be FGF19 amplification or FGF19 overexpression. And FGFR4 uh, inhibitors have been um, attested in FGF19, in both FGF19 amplified and overexpressed patients with a response rate of about 16%, which is pretty comparable to what immunotherapy gets you in uh, hepatocellular cancer. So there are potentially other, uh, other pathways that, that we can exploit in uh, hepatocellular cancer, um, uh, the TERT, uh, TP53, NOTCH, uh, et cetera. So in hepatocellular cancer, driver mutations uh, can be identified. However, most of them are not druggable. And um, there is a molecular classification of hepatocellular cancer, although we're not using it for treatment purposes yet. And uh, again, the trials on FGF19 are ongoing. Um, there was a, a, a drug, Tavantinib, that was studied in, in met high patients, which was unfortunately a negative study. Uh, just a few words on cholangiocarcinoma. So um, I think the, the important mutations that are, are noted and are in trials are IDH1, IDH2 uh, mutations and some FGFR uh, translocations. So to conclude, the, the therapeutic management for patients with gastrointestinal uh, cancers continues to develop and expand with molecular testing as well as targeted therapies and uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Um, I think certainly at UK, we uh, encourage next generation uh, sequencing in patients with advanced cancers. And as Dr. Rachel and Dr. Howe have alluded to, uh, molecular tumor board and precision medicine clinic certainly helped me in my practice. Uh, I've presented a couple of patients or a few patients and have been actually able to get uh, insurance approvals for these, uh, uh, some of these targeted agents. Um, we are dealing with challenges. Um, I think... Um, Particularly in Kentucky, patient travel is a, is a big factor. Uh, limited availability of clinical trials uh, for these patients. Um, the turnaround time of testing takes about three to four weeks for these tests to come back. Cost effectiveness and, and the emerging role of uh, liquid biopsies. But I think um, this is definitely worth in patients, you know, in ro robust patients who have gone through uh, standard lines of therapy um, and you know, are progressing. So thank you. <laughs>